Hi, this is Pastor Darren at Amazing Grace. Glad to have you join us again as we dig into the Word of God together. I trust you have your Bibles ready and you are hungry to uh, hear from what the Lord has for us today. <clears throat> When's the last time that someone encouraged you, paid you a compliment? Hmm? Maybe a, just a job well done. Hey, that was a great thing you did. An attaboy, an girl. When's the last time that actually happened? Sadly, it doesn't happen very often, does it? Well, why is that? Why is it that we are so quick to criticize and condemn and we're so slow to encourage and compliment? Unfortunately, there are some people out there who are great encouragers, right? And and boy, do we need those people now, don't we? We all need encouragement, especially in this crazy year. Well, today, as we continue our study in Bible characters, we're going to look at a great encourager by the name of Barnabas. Even his name reflects encouragement. And my prayer is that today you'll be able to find great encouragement from the word of God and from this man, Barnabas. So would you join me please as we pray and seek God together. <clears throat> Father, in the name of Jesus, we come and we, we pray that, that our hearts would be in tune with yours. We pray that you would speak your truth to us. We pray that we would be able to shut out everything that doesn't belong so that we can give you our undivided attention. And then I pray that you would speak your truth to us through your spirit, and that we would not just be hearers only, but doers and put into practice what you have for us today. Lord, would you speak as your children listen? In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we're first introduced to Barnabas in Acts chapter 4. If you would turn there, please, to Acts chapter 4. <clears throat> and we see in Acts chapter 4, beginning at verse 32, it says this. All the believers were one in heart and mind, and no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. And that was the normal practice of the church, of the early church. It was their DNA. You want to talk about being generous and gracious, even sacrificially. Look at verse 33. It says, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. Can you imagine? No needy persons. And it says from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Again, can you imagine? I mean, how many of you would be willing to sell your house and give the money to anyone in need? Yet that's what they did. That was their DNA to meet each other's needs, even at great cost. And the greatest example of meeting needs, even sacrificially, comes in the person of Barnabas. Now, if you're taking notes, <clears throat> we're going to look at some character traits of Barnabas. And the first point is this. He was an encourager. He was an encourager. Look at verse 36. It says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, he sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Sacrificial giving. And I love that the apostles named him son of encouragement. That was his nickname. And I can't think of a better name for this man. I mean, his encouraging spirit, 
his compassion in action, his, his sacrificial giving, it all was so obvious that it became his name, son of encouragement. It makes me wonder what our nickname would be if we were named after our character. Hmm. So Barnabas is an encourager. And we're going to see again and again how Barnabas lived up to his nickname. Turn ahead to Acts chapter 9, please. Acts chapter 9. Now, last week we took a look at the Apostle Paul. And you may recall that Paul had been a ruthless persecutor of believers until he met Christ. And then he became a passionate preacher of Christ, right? The problem is a lot of the believers and disciples didn't really believe him. I mean, they didn't trust him. And, and who could blame them? So look at Acts chapter 9, beginning at verse 26. Acts chapter 9, verse 26. <clears throat> it says, when Paul came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. And so Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. Barnabas comes alongside Paul. The second character trait we see of Barnabas, not only is he an encourager, but he also was an optimist. He was an optimist. See, Barnabas took the step of faith toward Paul. He saw the good in others rather than the bad. You might say he saw the potential rather than the problem. And isn't that a character trait we all should have? To see the potential and not just the problem. And think about this. We all know the incredible ministry that the Apostle Paul had. Think about this. Paul's ministry began because of Barnabas. Everything Paul did began because of Barnabas, because Barnabas took a chance on him, because Barnabas vouched for him. He encouraged him. Barnabas was the optimist. And those qualities, by the way, gave Barnabas another title. The third title we see is that he also was an evangelist. He was an evangelist. Jump ahead to Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Acts 11, verse 19. We know that when Stephen was stoned, we looked at that a few weeks ago. When Stephen was stoned, the church was scattered. And as they scattered, they went out and preached the gospel, even to the Gentiles. And the Jews didn't really know what to do with that. Look at Acts 11, look at verse 21. It says, the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. And news of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Antioch, by the way, is fairly close to Barnabas's homeland island of Cyprus. And it says, when he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. There he is again, encouraging the saints. And what an encouragement. Remain true to the Lord with all your heart. Oh, but he didn't stop there. Because look what else happens in verse 24. It says, he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. You see, he encouraged the saints to join him in evangelizing the lost, in, in sharing Christ with the lost. I mean, think about it this way. Barnabas's encouraging spirit actually led many people to Christ. His encouragement, his optimism, 
all of that just exuded from him and people were curious. They came to Jesus as a result of his encouragement. Now there's an idea, isn't there? You see, because Barnabas took a step of faith toward Paul, they actually began to form a very close friendship. Barnabas realized and when he was in Antioch, he realized the potential for ministry there, but he also realized he needed help. He needed a partner. And he couldn't think of a better partner than Paul. See, the fourth trait of Barnabas we see is that he was an associate. He was an associate. He was a partner in ministry. Barnabas wasn't too proud to ask for help. And we're going to see just how effective as uh, an associate that he was. Look down at verse 25 of Acts chapter 11. It says, Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And so for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. In fact, from this moment on, when, when Paul joins forces with Barnabas, just about every mention of Barnabas from this point on is with Paul. They form this dynamic duo that would go on to have an incredible impact for the kingdom of God. The two of them would go out preaching and changing lives and, and, and planting churches together. The next character trait that we see of Barnabas is also in chapter 11, and that is number five. He was an envoy. He was an envoy, an ambassador, a representative. First of all, he's, he's an envoy of the church in Antioch. Because we see in verse 27 and following that a prophet named Agabus came and he predicted that a famine was coming. So what does a church in Antioch do? They did what they always did. They took care of the needs. They took care of the church. Look at verse 29 of Acts 11. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. And this they did, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Hmm. I think it's funny that Barnabas is quickly becoming the go-to person for all sorts of needs. In fact, he's not just an envoy for the church in Antioch. He becomes an envoy, an ambassador for the kingdom of God. Jump ahead to Acts chapter 13, please. Acts chapter 13. We see in uh, verse 1, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, and it lists the names, including Barnabas. And it says in verse 2, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And so after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Hmm. And thus begins their first missionary journey, where Barnabas and Saul, or Paul, traveled throughout the Roman Empire preaching Christ. Barnabas uses his gift of encouragement and evangelism to reach countless people for Christ. He's a great envoy and ambassador for Christ. And just like Paul, Barnabas also suffered greatly for that calling. He also was imprisoned and beaten for his faith. And yet, they continued to preach Christ. No matter what, they continued to spread the gospel. And then, when they returned from this first missionary journey, they returned back to Antioch. Once again, Barnabas is called upon to be an envoy for the church at Antioch. Only this time, it's because of a theological dispute. Jump ahead to Acts chapter 15, please. Acts chapter 15. We see here that a dispute arose because 
some Jews claimed that the Gentiles needed to follow the Jewish law in order to be saved. They needed to be circumcised, for example, in order to be saved. So they still didn't know what to do with these Gentile Christians. And it says in verse 2 of Acts 15, this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them because Paul and Barnabas had just spent the past who knows how long preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. And so Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem and see the apostles and elders about this question. Do Gentiles need to follow the Jewish law to be saved? Well, Paul and Barnabas, as the envoy, they went to Jerusalem. They ended up convincing the other apostles, and they issued a decree to all the churches that basically said salvation is by grace through faith plus nothing. Grace through faith, not the law. Gentiles can come to Christ without becoming Jews. And later in chapter 15 of Acts, we see another dispute, except that this dispute is now between Paul and Barnabas. And this dispute is not a theological one. It really is more of personality and opinion. Remember, Barnabas was the encourager. Okay? He always saw the good in people. He was a people person. Paul, on the other hand, he was a type A. He was focused on the mission. You might say that Barnabas is focused on relationships, whereas Paul is focused on results. It's a difference of personality. And it comes to a head here in chapter 15, verses 36 and following. And in this, in this discussion, this dispute, we also see a sixth character trait of Barnabas. He was an advocate. He was an advocate. Take a look at chapter 15, verse 36. It says, sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. This is a great idea. Barnabas gets to go back and encourage the saints to stay true to the Lord. A great opportunity for him. And verse 37, Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, who happened to be his cousin, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. You see, John Mark started out with him in the first missionary journey, but he bailed. He quit. He gave up for whatever reason. Now, Barnabas, the optimist, he's ready to give him a second chance. Paul says, nope, once and done, once and done. And it says in verse 39, they had sh such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. They split up. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. It's interesting that Barnabas stood up for Mark in the same way that he stood up for Paul. But apparently Paul had forgotten that point. And so because of a difference of opinion, because of differing personalities, this dynamic duo that turned the world upside down for Christ splits up. And it ends up becoming two missionary outreaches. So Barnabas the encourager, the optimist, the, the advocate is, is doing all he can to use his gifts for the glory of God. And yet, ironically, there's a potential downside to being an encourager and an optimist. Now, it's a great upside. We love people that encourage others and see the good in people, right? But the downside is that Often encouragers and optimists can get so caught up in the people, trying to please the people, that they end up compromising their, their faith. They compromise their mission. 
They don't want to offend anybody. So they ended up compromising where they shouldn't. It's one of the downsides of being an encourager and an optimist. And, and we see that exact thing happen to Barnabas. Turn please to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. And here we see the seventh trait, if you will, of Barnabas. And that was that is that he was led astray. He was led astray because he didn't want to hurt people. He was a people person. Look at Galatians chapter 2, uh, at verse 12. So the, the account is that Paul rebukes Peter because Peter showed favor to the Jews over the Gentiles. He was being a hypocrite. Look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 12. Paul is writing this. He says, For before certain men came from James, who was the pastor back in Jerusalem, Peter used to eat with the Gentiles. But when the Jews arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. Peter became a hypocrite because he didn't want to offend his Jewish brothers. Again, that's one of the caveats of focusing too much on relationships. And look at verse 13. The other Jews joined Peter in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Even Barnabas. Because Barnabas also didn't want to offend anyone. He was a people person. He was all about relationships. And that's good to a degree. Now, the truth is, we don't know what happened after this. I would like to believe that Barnabas and Peter both repented of their hypocrisy. They, they saw where they had failed and, and that they continued to use their gifts for God's glory. Especially because we need more people like Barnabas. In fact, I have to say that Barnabas is probably one of my favorite characters in Scripture. He's such an encourager, such a, a people person. And no, he wasn't perfect. But what an encouragement he was to so many people. He was an encourager, an optimist, an evangelist, an associate, an envoy, and an advocate. It's no wonder that God used him in such a powerful way. And yet, as we look at Barnabas's life, it really begs us to ask a key question. Why don't we encourage others? Why don't we encourage others like we should? I mean, why are we so hesitant to build others up or to pay them a compliment? Let me give you just four reasons why we don't encourage others like we should. First reason is because of pride. Pride, our ego. We get thinking, well, if I compliment them, if I build them up, then it might make me look soft or weak or less in comparison. As if somehow we think that building others up actually brings us down. You know, it's not cool to compliment. Or we think, well, I don't want it to go to his head, right? And we've heard that before, right? I don't want it to go to his head. Yeah. When in reality, we need to get it out of our heads, don't we? We need to, to get off our high horse, our pride, our ego, and build others up, don't we? So pride is one reason why we don't encourage, we don't compliment. Another reason that is very similar is self. Self. We're so focused on ourselves. We're so focused on our own needs, our own agenda, that we don't even think about others. It doesn't even occur to us to compliment someone else. Think of someone else. Because we're consumed with self. Third reason why we don't encourage others is because of fear. We're afraid that if we 
compliment them, if we encourage them, it, they might take advantage of us. They might exploit us. We're afraid. And the fourth reason why we don't encourage is because of vengeance. Vengeance. They hurt me. I'm going to hurt them. I'm not going to give them a compliment when they tear me down. An eye for an eye, right? Tragically, we see this all too often in our own marriages, don't we? We don't compliment or build up because we feel hurt by them. To put it bluntly, we don't encourage because we're sinful, selfish, stubborn sheep. That's it. We're sinful, selfish, stubborn sheep. And by the way, I hope you realize that all four of those excuses for not encouraging, it's sin, isn't it? They're all examples of sin. You know, there are numerous commands in Scripture for us to encourage and build others up. So when we don't encourage others, when we don't compliment them, when we don't build them up, we are sinning against God and against the body of Christ. We are commanded to build others up. Let me share with you just a few scripture passages to, to back up what I'm saying. Colossians chapter 2, verse 2. Paul writes, he says, My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. Now, isn't that something we all should pursue? Isn't that something we can encourage others to do? To be built up in the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. So I have to ask, are we, in fact, building others up and encouraging others? Or are we too busy tearing them down? Hebrews 3.13 says, But encourage one another daily as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You see, encouragement is a deterrent to sin. I mean, when I, if I spend my time encouraging our kiddos, for example, I'm going to get a much better response from them than if I continually discourage them and criticize them, right? Encouragement is a real deterrent to sin. We can encourage and build others up to help prevent them from falling into sin. Hebrews 10.25 says, Let us not give up meeting together, even online, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So do you see the day approaching? Do you think that Jesus might be coming soon? I mean, look at the mess this world is in. How can he wait much longer? And so if Jesus is coming back soon, it's all the more reason for us to encourage one another every day to remain true to the Lord, to hang in there. Don't give up. Jesus is coming. There's hope. Now more than ever, we need to be encouraging each other each and every day. Let me ask you this. When's the last time that you gave your spouse a compliment, a sincere compliment? How about your kids? How about your parents? How about your coworkers? How about your boss? When's the last time that you paid them a compliment, that you encouraged them? Is it really that hard to tell someone that you appreciate them, that you appreciate the job they did? Is it that hard to encourage somebody to keep on their, their walk with the Lord? Let's break this bad habit of refusing to encourage 
Let's be encouragers and not discouragers, okay? In other words, let's be a Barnabas. Let's be a Barnabas. That's the bottom line. Let's be a Barnabas. Be an encourager. Be an optimist. Be an advocate. Help that person who just needs a second chance. Because you will never know how you could change the world of just one person with just one compliment. If you could change someone's life by being an encourager. So let me give you one challenge this week. It's not hard. Here's the challenge. I want you to encourage someone daily this week. I want you to pay someone a compliment, encourage them in some way every day this week, okay? Will you do that? Will you make a pledge to encourage someone every day this week? And I'd love to hear about it, not to brag, but, but to be encouraged. Let me know how it goes. Let me know how you might be encouraged by being an encourager. Let's do all we can to encourage others to follow Christ. Let's do all we can to change their world. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the example of Barnabas. What an encourager. He looked beyond faults. He saw the potential rather than the problem. He went out of his way, even sacrificially, to build others up. What an encouragement for us. So, Lord, I pray that we wouldn't just sit and listen to this message, that we wouldn't just read these passages of Scripture. I pray that we would put them into practice, that we would live them out for the glory of God. Lord, we see that the times are at hand. We know that you're coming again soon, so help us to be encouragers every day. Help us to do all we can to build others up, to give them hope. And Father, I pray that I might be an encouragement even now to that person who's watching this right now, and maybe they feel hopeless. Maybe they don't know what this is all about, this this walk with Jesus, this encouragement. Lord, maybe there's, there are some here right now who have not bowed the knee to Jesus. They've not yet turned their heart over to you. And I pray that even now they would do that. They would cry out to you and say, God, I need help. I am so lost. I'm so messed up. I need your help. I need that hope and that encouragement that I just heard about. Father, I pray that that you would bring many, many people to you and that we would be encouragers to bring many more people to you. God, would you help us to maintain that that challenge, that commitment to, to encourage someone every day this week and then the next week and the next week so that we can do all we can to build them up and change their world. One compliment at a time. May it be so, Lord. May it be so. In Jesus' name. Amen. I have to tell you, I so enjoy spending this time with you. I hope that you were encouraged by the Word of God tonight. Again, I would love to hear back from you. Send me a message. Uh, make a comment on the on the, the, the feed here. And let's continue to be encouragers. And Lord willing... We'll see you again next week, and I hope you're encouraged even more then. Lord bless.